Good afternoon, and praise the Lord. I trust that these messages on praise have been a blessing to you. I see we are already having computer problems. If it locks up, I will have to wait till the weather passes and I will come back and do this message. You pray with me right now that the Lord is able to work through this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would cause this internet service to be strong and clear and not jumpy and glitchy, that people would be able to hear and receive the word of the living God. Father God, I ask you to move and minister today. Anoint with the anointing that makes preaching easy and effective. Cause my mind to be clear, my thoughts to be clear, my words to be concise. And Lord, most of all, I need the anointing of God. I need the overwhelming presence of God to be upon this even greater than you were last week. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Amen. We're going to try something new today. I'm going to play a song. Now, if this doesn't work for us, I'll try some things over the course of the next several weeks. I thought the communion went wonderful last week. And so I just want you, as I've told you before, if this is where you're going to church now, I want you to uh, sit on the front pew, as my friend Harold Wall said, pay attention, throw your hands up in there, clap your hands, sing along. And I'm going to play a lot of different kinds of music because as I'm going to show you, praise is a flexible thing. And we're going to, to learn. And if it's not your particular style, worship anyway. We'll get to you in a moment. You don't have to have it always your way, do you? God bless you. This is a song we used to do in our church called I Love to Praise His Name. Glory to God. Glory to God. 
Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know I have this morning. I've been running around the house all morning praising him and worshiping him and glorifying his name. And I pray that this is happening to you. I, I The whole uh, mission of this set of messages is to see your praise restored. And when your praise is restored, your strength will be restored. Your joy will be restored. And, and you'll be able to, to go devil hunting with the fly swatter. So let's just thank the Lord right now. Lord, we thank you. We do love to praise your holy name. We don't have to be talked into it. We don't have to be begged into it. We love to praise your holy name. We glorify and magnify your name. The title of today's message is the piracy, like a pirate on an ocean ship, the piracy of praise, the piracy of praise. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. You could also see the companion text in 1 Kings chapter 14, but we're going to use the Chronicler. It was written uh, quite a bit later, and so uh, maybe give us a little further information. Let's go to verse 9. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. This is 2 Chronicles, 13, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 9. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Instead, of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard and they kept that kept entrance to the king's house. And when the king entered the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them into the guard chamber. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned away from him that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. Now, we've got to lay some backdrop this morning of a backstory. We have David, who is a man after God's own heart. And we have established already he is a worshiper in spite of who didn't like it. When his wife, Michael, didn't like it, he quickly informed her, Honey, you didn't make me king. God made me to be king. Took me from being a shepherd boy. Now, I want us to pray one more time. Lord, I'm asking you to pierce our hearts this morning. Pierce our hearts with the word of God and pour in the oil of gladness. Pour in the oil of gladness today, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I want to thank all of you that have been offering me suggestions about these horrible <clears throat> allergies that I have. I thank you for your caring, and I couldn't tell you how much more humiliated I could be than to have to do that. But I thank you that you care and for your suggestions. And I've already been doing a lot of them. It's just something I've had to wear for a long time and the arthritis made it a lot worse. And I want it gone. I believe in the healing and the blood of Jesus. And I would like to be healed this day by the blood. But let's go back to the background. We have David who is a man after God's own heart. And David is, uh, a warrior. He is a warrior and a worshiper. If there's any things he's good at, it's going to war and worshiping God. And he's honed his craft of worship and warfare on the backside of the desert, if you will, tending his father's sheep. Well, you know the story. God raises him up and anoints him and, and only took 13 years roughly later before he got to be king. It is a process. And I want to just insert that to you, that every promise God has made to us has a process attached to it. And so we have the process of the promise. Well, then we have along comes Solomon. Now Solomon was David's baby through Bathsheba, through that terrible incident of adultery. And Solomon comes along and he is the wisest and the richest and most powerful man in the world at that point. And his wisdom spreads far and wide and I always look at Solomon, I'm like, you, he reminds me of, of, of a lot of people that are smart, but boy, they do dumb things. And so 
Solomon is a wise man, and he seeks the Lord for wisdom. The Lord grants him wisdom, and gives him the ability to go in and come out and to lead the people. But he's got a problem. He's got the same problem his daddy had. He likes women. You see, Deuteronomy 17, 16 says, to be king in Israel, you must not have multiple wives. You must not heap silver and gold under yourself. <clears throat> and you must not have horses from Egypt. And so in the midst of all that, we find that Solomon, his father David, now he basically only committed one of those sins. Excuse me, I want to turn this off to make sure there's no problems. And he only committed one of those sins. That was with Bathsheba. But we know that when it came to Solomon, he committed all three. He had a thousand wives and concubines. He had 40,000 Egyptian horses. And the Bible said that they were so wealthy till silver was like dust on the ground. You see, you listen to me well. I don't have any children, but I've learned well watching. There's only three ways to raise good children, by example, and by example, and by example. And mom and dad, what they see you getting by with, and the games you play, and the silliness you do with God, it will be multiplied in the next generation. Then we come to Rehoboam. Solomon has passed on. He's already received word that the, temp, that the kingdom will be torn away from him. He has an adjutant by the name of Jeroboam, who takes 10 tribes to the north. And they established the worship of golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And you know that it said that that affected the land for 1,500 long years, false religion. Honey, false religion didn't start yesterday, and it probably won't end tomorrow. But in the midst of all that, we must have a remnant of people that are hungry for God and wanting God to move. Now, I want to remind you of something. You've got the first generation of every movement that are like David, a man after God's own heart. Then you come to the second generation that simply seems to get it by tradition and that just won't get the job done. And then we come to the third generation, Rehoboam, and he's polishing brass and calling it gold and just don't let anybody look too close. It's the same over and over throughout the scriptures. Abraham was God's man of faith and he lit out from Ur of the Chaldees not even knowing where he was going, but he was looking for a city that had foundations and its builder and maker's God. By the time Isaac came along, it was pretty much a traditional thing, just do what dad did, instead of having your own personal vibrant experience. By the time we get to the third generation, Jacob, he's a game player. Chicanery is his name. He's a con man. And he's always trying to figure out some way to beat God and beat everybody else. But you know, God touched him in the hollow of his thigh and he limped away from Peniel. I want you to hear me well. I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm not trying to put anybody's denomination down. I'm simply stating the facts. Did you know going back 500 years to the Reformation, that the Lutherans were vibrant, fervent worshipers? As a matter of fact, they condemned old Martin Luther for taking the hymns, for taking the melodic line out of beer joint songs and putting them in the church. They said, oh, my God, he's gone too far. What is wrong with him? Why does he behave that way? I don't think anybody would walk into most Lutheran churches today and recognize the fervent vibrancy that was in the original. And then along came the Anabaptist, and it needs to be rebaptized. It's where we get the wonderful Southern Baptists from. And so the Anabaptist, and, and, and can I just remind you of something? The Lutherans fought the Anabaptist. This is something that needs to be talked about this morning since you brought it up. You see, denominations have always fought each other, and what denominations were created on was the basis of furtherance of revelation. The reason uh, Martin Luther came along with one scripture, the just shall live by faith, and he challenged the entire Roman Catholic Church. And they burned folks at the stake and everything else, but they kept on going. Then along came the Baptists with the revelation to be baptized, to be immersed in water. And you know who it was that fought them? The Lutherans. Then the Anabaptists 
gave way to the Wesleyan movement. That's our Methodist brothers and sisters. And they gave way to the Methodists. And when the Methodists came along, guess who fought them? The Anabaptists. And then the Methodists <clears throat> gave way, and they gave way to the Holiness people. Now, Methodists were Holiness people, but they gave away to the Pentecostals. We'll just get it said what we've called Pentecostals anyway. And they gave way to that great move of God in Wales and in Azusa Street. And it spread all over the world. And that Azusa Street revival produced things most of you will ever know. I heard one story from there that always blessed me. It was a man named Brother Abraham from India. Brother Abraham got saved. And when he got saved, he'd been saved just a few days. And he began to pray. And he came all the way from India to Los Angeles, California. Didn't know why, just knew God told him to go. He got there, went to the Azusa Street Mission. God baptized him in the Holy Ghost. And he spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. When he got through praying that night, the Lord spoke to him and said, go back to India. Can you imagine traveling by boat from India to Los Angeles to be in one service? It had to have been a good one. He went back to India and he built over a thousand churches in India. You see, what that original spark is birthed in all of us, whether it's Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, the charismatic movement, or what I believe is now the remnant movement, <clears throat> the originators of it, the fathers, they're great and fervent men. But it gives way too many times to tradition, and it gives way to ways to manage it. You see, I'm going to tell you, true revelation doesn't need a manager. And that's what happens to us in our denominational religion too many times. We begin to manage the resources of someone else's revelation. And as A.W. Tozer said, we join churches so they'll tell us what to believe rather than not being lazy and seeking the Lord our own and deciding what to believe. Someone very close to me said the other day that they made the comment, said, you know, if he's right, we've got it all tightened up. Honey, i got news for you. I am right. The word is right. I'm not right. I'm like O.G.E. Patterson. The Bible is right and somebody's wrong. But I need to tighten up. And I know if I do, you all do as well. So we come to Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam, we, we read very plainly that he has sinned. We go back into that 12th chapter. Go back into the beginning of it. I'm using my Bible today. Instead of by tablet. So, and it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, or Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Look at that first verse. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established his kingdom and strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk about you business people. There are many of you, when you didn't have the money to even make payroll that week for yourself, you didn't even have any employees, you were fervent before God and you sought him with all your heart. But then he blessed you and it became one employee and two employee and five locations and 35 locations and a whole wealth of money coming in. And I have a question to ask you, sir, ma'am, are you as fervent for him today as you were in the days when you couldn't meet payroll and couldn't hardly keep the lights on? Do you love him like you did when you had to truly pray, give us this day our daily bread? You see, I've just come through one of the hardest, longest trials a human being could go through. And I don't want to lose that intimacy that I gained in an extra special way during that just because things are a little better now. I want to be fervent and burning hot for him. Rehoboam, we read, comes along. And you see, I want to tell you something. Uh, again, I'm not picking on anybody's thing. Who would have ever dreamed when the great Lutheran church let down their worship standard, if you will, that they would be arguing over whether you could ordain a sodomite to be a preacher? Who would have ever dreamed it? Who would have ever dreamed that when the Southern Baptists came along, so on fire for God. There was a time, especially in country Baptist churches, even in this country, less than 100 years ago, they shouted and they had the amen corner and they, pre they shouted the preacher down. 
but they decided they were too good for that. They needed Dr. Jack Frost in the pulpit, a mild-mannered preacher, preached mild-mannered sermons to mild-mannered people on how to be more mild-mannered. And they lost the Vance Havners of this thing. And they replaced them with little boys giving motivational speeches for the most part and for God's sakes to make you sure that no matter what you do, you're still going to heaven if you ever signed our card. And now they're arguing over the very inerrancy of the scriptures. Does it even mean what it says? And then along comes my people from 100 years ago, or plus, the Pentecostal people. But go back to the Westlands. I don't want to jump them. The Westlands came along, and they were so radical. John Wesley preached on everything from a stump to the top of a tombstone. He was radical and wild and, and glorifying God. And his brother Charles wrote some of the most beautiful hymns that we sing even today. And we come along and all of a sudden, the on fire, blistering hot camp meetings of the Methodists died. You know, the Presbyterians used to be a shouting people in the second great awakening at the Camp Creek revivals in Kentucky. It was filled with Methodist people slain under the power of God, shouting and dancing and speaking with tongues. And, and the power of God was prevalent because they worshiped purely. I told you very plainly, you must worship God with a pure heart and a whole heart. When those are right, worship will be natural. And they praised and glorified God. Do you think I'm lying about it? Let's go look it up. Do some church history study. Then we Pentecostal people came along and a one-eyed black man in Los Angeles with his head stuck in an orange crate because he was afraid he'd see the glory of God. Prayed and prayed and prayed and they only allowed the spirit to move and they judged everything by the word according to Seymour. And they would quickly sit you down if you were in self, as the old folks said, or in the flesh. My God, they'd have to set the whole bunch down today to be quite plain about it. They'd have to set the whole. I look today, and since you brought it up again, I look at the vulgarity of the tight clothing of both men and women in worship. I did not come here to see what you shouldn't be showing me. And I don't appreciate you letting it be seen so openly. And since you brought it up, I'm going to say it. It belies the root of irreverence that is deep within you, the hatred for authority the hatred for a God to actually rule over you. And something's wrong with us now. But I go back just a little bit. Bear with me to my people. There was a time that Pentecostal people were known for their singing. They were known for their worship. And if you went to one of our churches, they didn't apologize about it. I remember when I first got saved, I heard a preacher saying, we don't want anybody to shout. We don't want anybody to dance. We don't want anybody to this, that, or the other. And since you brought all this up, let's just stay with it a few minutes. I'm going to say it to you plainly. What we should have done 70 years ago when the latter rain movement started and people started pouring into our churches and throughout the charismatic movement, when they came from the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians and, and the Catholics and everywhere else, we should have greeted them at the door and this should have been our greeting. We are so glad you're here. We have been praying for you to come. We've been witnessing you at school and on the job. And we're glad you've come to worship with us. But make no mistake about it. We are not going to do anything to suit you. If you liked where you left, you should have stayed there. But here, we worship God fervently. We worship God spontaneously. We worship God with our whole heart. And we make no apologies for it. What we should have said is we invite you to come in. And the table is spread and the bowls are filled. And I want you to dip up all you can hold. But you don't make any mistake about it. We make no changes in the menu just to suit you. This fair that we are feeding on today brought us out of a brush harbor. It brought us out of poverty. It brought us out of ignorance. It brought us out of sin. And it brought us into a place, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost with a blessing of God is upon us and we'll not change it. But instead, we allowed people to come in and say, well, I'm not comfortable with this. And I'm going to say it to you plain. One of the biggest reasons that people don't worship like they should today is fear. And they're worried, what will I look like? What will people think? Honey, you ought to hear what they're saying about you now. It's not very good. Worship him. Glorify him. I've often said, 
The world thinks we're in here swinging from the chandeliers. I, God, we ought to at least try and give them something to talk about. We ought to glorify him and magnify him. You say, well, I don't understand. I don't either. I don't understand. People say, well, is it necessary? I said, well, no, but neither is taking a hot shower. But it sure feels good when you get one. And there's nothing that will take the place of being lost in the presence of God. There's nothing that will ever take the place of being so caught up in him. You don't even know what building you're in, much less care what somebody else thinks. I want you to listen to me well. True worship must transcend our feelings. True worship must transcend our fears. True worship must transcend our fears. And see, when fear sets in, there becomes a resistance. And I'll be honest with you. In all my years of travel, I didn't have Baptist people, Methodist people, Presbyterian people, Catholic people, anybody else <laughs> to resist me. The only ones that resisted me were burned over folks. Folks that used to have a song. The folks that used to praise him. Folks that used to magnify him. Folks that used to glorify him. And they fought it because they'd become fearful. They knew if he showed up, he would convict. And so they replaced the worship service with a song service. And a song service is not a worship service unless God's in it. Then it becomes worship. And so, you see, we have become a people. We've compromised. That's a terrible word in God's economy. Compromised. Compromised. You see, I, I, I want to just get a hold of this. and I don't want you to miss it. Gold, number one, is rare. And gold is represented here as of worship and testimony, worship and testimony. And so Rehoboam has become king. He's built the fortified cities of Judah. He thinks nobody can get to Jerusalem to attack them, but he will not have the Lord rule over him. So the Lord says, you don't like me ruling over you? How about I let Shishak rule over you? I'll show you what true bondage is, Rehoboam. You think it's bondage just because I won't let you sleep around and be a fool and commit every kind of sexual perversion there is. Well, I'm going to come in and take away your testimony. I'm going to take away your defenses. There was a time in every church going back 500 years at least that there were old saints of God who were like watchmen on the wall and the devil didn't have a chance. I get to thinking of all the church shootings and the foolishness going on today. And I think I wonder what those old Methodist women, those old Baptist women, those old Pentecostal women with the top knot on their head. I can't help but wonder if they would run and hide under a pew or if they would stand up and rebuke him in the name of Jesus and plead the blood. And take his gun away from him and take him to the altar and pray for him. You see, we've lost our defenses. You see, shields of gold. That's for defense. And that word shields literally means covers the whole body, the whole man. I want you to understand that true praise covers the whole man. True praise covers your whole family. True praise will ward off the enemy. True praise will be very costly. True praise can only be done by the redeemed. I want you to listen to me good. True praise is blood bought. Worship was blood-bought from the time it started. It was blood-bought in the Old Testament with bullocks and goats and sheep and pigeons. And in the New Testament, it's the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We are bought with not corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb slain. So you see, your privilege and responsibility to praise him is blood-bought. It is only the blood-bought that can truly worship him. It is only the blood ball that can truly give him glory and honor. I said that true worship must be word-based and spirit-inspired. It must be born of God. It must be born of God. <laughs> so we have our worship that is protective. It is costly. It is our testimony of how far we've come. We're no longer a little shepherd boy on the backside of a desert. But I fear that we've become like Thomas Aquinas told Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX was showing Thomas Aquinas through all the papal treasures. And he said, you see, my dear Thomas, 
He said, no longer do we have to say silver and gold, have I none. And Aquinas looked at him and said, sir, no longer can you say rise and walk in the name of Jesus. You see, I'm afraid that we've traded our praise for a higher position. You see, God brought us as a people, all of us, off the back street up to Main Street. But I wonder if we didn't leave him on the back street. And he'd like to join us. I remember once we did a remodeling job and my church just took out a wall to make sanctuary bigger. And I was very concerned because we had such wonderful services. I was very concerned that any deviation, and that may sound funny to you, but I don't want anything to make him uncomfortable. You see, I want him to feel at home in my life, in my home, in my services. I want him to feel comfortable, do whatever he wants to do. I remember meeting a man one time. They told me he was quite a devout Bible teacher. And I was telling him about the service we'd had that Sunday, and he began to weep. And I thought, I said, what's wrong? I tell it was not a good cry. He said, I could never come to your church. I said, why? He said, it's evident you let God do anything he wants to. And that would scare me. You see, fear is a dominating factor in the destruction of true praise. Fear that he will expose our sins. Fear that he may cause us to be uncomfortable. Or fear that he may take away our position. And we, in the meantime, we've traded away our praise. Solomon built 500 shields of gold. Depending on what you want to believe about the weight of a talent, they are worth a minimum of $64 million. <clears throat> and may well be worth a billion dollars. Praise is costly. I said it was blood bought. You heard me, didn't you? Blood bought. It cost something to have a testimony. I love the old Milton Brunson song, I've got a testimony, and I do have a testimony. My wife has a testimony. You have a testimony. But is it gold or is it brass? If it's gold, it happened because God created in Genesis 2. We find the first reference to gold. And gold all the way through the end of the Bible. Gold, gold, gold. Representative of the divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. Gold. Heaven is filled. I may say this seven times. I don't know. Heaven is filled with two things. Praise and gold. Praise and gold. Praise and gold. Always, as I've said, the redeemed doing the praising. I've always preached and told people, I said, there are times you can't pray your way out of a wet paper bag. I said, but if you'll start to praise him, if you'll start to magnify him, if you'll start to glorify him and tell him you are my rock, my sword, my shield, you are a wheel in the middle of a wheel. You are the God who will never let me down. You're just a jewel that I have found. Hallelujah. And may I just interject here. I'll say it a thousand more times before we quit, I'm sure. The word hallelujah. It means to boast, to brag, to laud upon, even to the point of looking foolish. It is not a word, by God, I feel his presence. It is not a word that is to be so much thought about and then said, but it is a word that is to erupt out of one's innermost being. Halal and Yah is the name of God. Hallelujah. Halal, Yah. It is time that we praised and magnified him spontaneously. It should erupt from our innermost being. There was a time when most of you listening to this message were in that position, but many of you have lost your song. You've had it dampened down through situations and troubles and trials and fear, and even fear has given way. I remember people making a comment, you know, we don't want to have a Pentecostal parade, really? Well, it's better than this parade of ignorance we're putting out every week. And we get so ashamed and afraid somebody might dance or somebody might shout or somebody might give way to, to just erupting into glorifying God. Honey, that was God's plan from the beginning. The word hallelujah is almost the same in every known language on this earth. You know why? It's because every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation will use that word. And if they don't know anything else, when they get to heaven, we'll all be on the same page and how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing. And when the saints of God get together, if they can't do anything else, just sing hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. 
I was listening not long ago to uh, Walt Whitman doing the world choir thing. And there were choir, 50,000 choir members from all over the world. And they started singing my favorite song, Oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. And they sang it with 50,000 people and some great musicians. And they erupted in that place. And all I could think was, oh, my God, that's a foretaste of heaven divine. That's a foretaste of what's coming in the days ahead when we'll reach heaven and praise him. But I go back to Rehoboam. Bear with me and forgive me if, if I wandered too much for you. And see, we have the symbolism of the shields, which is costly. It is protective and it is testimony. We've covered that. But when Shishak came, and I'm going to say it plainly, Shishak came to our churches too. Woo, I'm going to make everybody upset with this. He came in riding on Christian television. Christian television was a Trojan horse to destroy worship. You notice you watch movies, sometimes this movie has been edited for content and formatted for time. When we became so time conscious and so content conscious that we were afraid we would upset people. I used to hear that all the time. You can't say this and you can't say that. That's controversial. I know it's biblical. The Bible's controversial. It is a stumbling stone for some people. But I, I, I look and I see the substitute we brought in. Instead of singing about Jesus, we started singing about him. And started singing about heaven, we sang about a place. You see how subtle this was? And when's the last time your church just broke out and sang, When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Glory to God. When's the last time you sang with that blood-washed throne? We will shout and sing over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ my Lord and King. Just over in the glory land. And all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Hallelujah. So we've substituted. You see brass and gold. If you polish brass enough, it'll fool you if you don't look too close. <coughs> Excuse me. So Rehoboam, he didn't want the people to know the gold had been taken. So he took brass, which is an amalgamation or an adulterated form. It's copper and zinc. He mixed it together and he said, just don't let the people get too close to it. Don't let them see your lives. Keep it hidden. And, you know, I noticed <clears throat> originally these shields of brass and gold were held, Song of Solomon 4 and 4, in a, uh, an armory out of the edge where nobody could attack it and steal it <laughs> because the praise was precious. The testimony meant something. And it was kept out in an armory, but then by this time, they're just sticking it in a closet, if you will, a storage area until the next time. You see, these shields of brass may well have been what blew the Queen of Sheba's mind. She heard of the wisdom of Solomon, so she came up from Ethiopia with a $50 million offering. And you think you might have given too much, huh? You think your praise might be a little exuberant? I doubt it. And here she came with a $50 million offering. And when she came up the way, she came to see Solomon and he answered all of her hard questions. But she said, when I got to the church, she said, I just saw the processional that led the king in. That would have been those shields, those 500 shields, 200 large ones, 300 small, glorifying and magnifying God. And the sun glittering off of them and the band singing and the parking lot attendants, parking chariots, if you will. And she said, it took my breath away 
And I lost my breath that day. And she said, I didn't bring a big enough checkbook to write a check for this. She said, for the half has not yet been told. And I just want to say to you, if she felt that way about Solomon and his temple, <clears throat> Jesus said one greater than Solomon is here. You see, at the birth of Solomon, there were probably heralds that ran through the streets and said, the king has a new son. But honey, when Jesus was born, an angelic retinue of knights broke out and sang glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. One greater than Solomon is here. And since one greater than Solomon is here, don't you think the praise ought to be greater than it was in Solomon's day? Don't you think it ought to be a greater and a grander entrance to bring in the king? Please excuse me. When the king comes in, it ought to be an ushering in of the presence of God. When we glorify the king of all kings, we bring in Jesus. And it is our testimony. We are not ashamed, but you see, brass is, 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 it may look like gold, but doesn't cost near as much. And I want to ask you this. What's your testimony cost God? What's your praise cost you? You see, David, his father, since you brought it up, we'll just go back and I'm going to be a few minutes. When David brought it up, you see, he had numbered Israel. And he tried to get all puffed up how many people attended his church. You hear me, don't you, preacher? Stop counting. Even on the day of Pentecost, it said about 3,000. They never counted them. <clears throat> Later on, he said about 5,000. <coughs> but he didn't count them. David numbered Israel. And when he numbered Israel, the Lord gave him three options. He said, I'd rather fall into your hands than anybody I know. And the Lord began to bring pestilence through the land. And David looked up and he saw the angel of the Lord with a sword drawn, going to kill everything in Jerusalem. And I love it. David did the only thing you can do. He went to Ornon or Aruna, whichever one you want to call him. And he said, I want to buy this whole place. He said, I got to have a place to worship. Worship is the only thing that's going to stop this pestilence. You hear me well, saints of God. Your worship may be the only thing holding back the end of time. Your, and you say, well, I want to go to heaven. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying it may be holding back the plague. It may be holding back the deluge of sin because something's got to be removed before that man of sin can have full course. It may be you and I singing, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him for the fir in the firmament of his power, praise him for his excellent greatness. It may very well be the praise of some little old woman in a room that is saying, I'll pay full price. And Aruna said, I'll give you the whole place. David, you're the king. David said, I refuse to offer that to God, which costs me nothing. I want to pay full price. And through the blinding tears and the smoke ascending from the sacrifice, we see the angel resheath that sword. And it is on that very ground that Solomon's temple was built. It was on the threshing floor of Aruna that they built Solomon's temple. And I believe that David looked through the blinding tears of his disappointment in himself and his fear of God. And he looked forward and he offered sacrifice. But I believe he saw the building of a greater house than he had ever known. Greater than the tabernacle of Moses. Greater than the tabernacle of David. Greater than anything. And he saw that which took the breath from the queen of Sheba. I'm going to say it to you plain. If you're going to have a great testimony, somebody's going to pay full price. Probably both you and Jesus for that matter. So they built Solomon's temple there and the queen came and she was overwhelmed. But Solomon, he loved other women. He feared God, but served other gods. I'm afraid that's for most of us. Most of us have got some room in our life. We haven't given God full clearance to go in. And he's grieved and hurt and bruised by the church today. We've polished brass and called it gold. We've laid it to the waist. We've brought it out on special days. We let someone sing a song. My friend Edward Stone's grandfather was a great and a powerful man. They didn't want Brother Stone to preach at any of the big meetings. But when it was dead or four o'clock, they'd say, Brother Stone, will you pray for us? And he had prayed the power had come down. And so we trot out our special singer who's still anointed. We trot out 
the preacher who uses Pavlovian treatment. You know the story of Pavlov's dogs. If you don't, go study it. It is called response stimuli. It's I say certain things and you shout. I get a response. I say something and you respond correctly. And preachers have become marvelous at doing this. And they've learned that all you really want to hear is about what's in the covenant for me, not what are the boundaries of the covenant. And so they only tell you things that make you feel good. And what you think is all this exuberant jumping up and down worship that's going on today is not worship at all. It's just a fleshly display of I want to hear more about what's in it for me. You see, <clears throat> gold doesn't depreciate under trial. Brass will come apart. Gold, no matter how hot you heat it, will only come forth finer. Job said he knows the way that I take. When I've come forth, I'll come forth as pure gold. Gold can be put in the trial and the crucible, and anything that's not tried in God's economy is not worthy of holding on to. When our praise glorifies him, the devil will test it. You hear me well. Every revelation will be tested. When you received a revelation about giving, you remember how in the beginning it took off and God bless you and you went, oh my God, this is great. But then it wasn't long. You were in a tight spot because the devil had to try that revelation. He has to test it to try to kill it because it'll get out of hand. He does the same with praise and worship. He does all he can do to hinder it. He does all he can do to choke it down through fear rejection, worrying about what people think, all those things we've already covered. And so we, we find that these shields of brass, they are tried. Our praise has been tried. You say you're very fervent. Yes, but I've been through hell with my back broke. It cost me everything to get here. It cost me everything to learn how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. I lost everything. It cost me something to learn how to lift up my hands in the middle of the night. It cost me something just to tell him, I love to praise your holy name. You are my rock, my soul. Glory to God. Glory to God. You're my everything. And you feel with all in all, you're all that I desire and all that I want. I love you. I magnify you. I glorify you. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for anointing me today. Hallelujah. So we have the brand. And today we have a ministry that is in a shambles. Our worship leaders and our preachers are falling on every hand. and God help them to get right with you. They're falling everywhere, and the whole thing has become brass, and just don't look too close, don't ask too many questions, don't judge. It started two generations ago with touch not mine anointed, which meant don't ask any questions about the preacher, when that's not what that scripture means. And then it became judge not, lest you be judged. Now we've moved into a realm of I don't want to hear anything but something positive. I don't want to hear anything except what's in it for me. Brass all the way, an amalgamated mess. Is there something in it for you? Yes. Is there something required of you? Yes. Much required. To them that much is given, much will be required, Jesus said. I want to just touch a couple of things. Gold is a wonderful conductor of electricity. I heard Brother Patterson say the other day, he was talking about the old song, Jesus on the Main Line. He said, those old folks back when they had party lines, and most of you don't know anything about that, but it'd be five or six people on one party line. They'd listen in. That's how they gossiped back then. They listened. But they just believed that if they could come to Jesus and, and the operator would plug in that cord for them, that's going way back for some of you, and she would plug in their number that they would sing Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Call him up and tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. And they believed that if their shield was gold, it'd be a better conduit and the electricity would flow freer. Did you know that in high-end sound equipment, they use gold-plated ends on the RCA plugs and other, other kind of plug they use? It's because it conducts the sound better. 
my friend called me this week and he said, I've been listening to the message. He said, they got that sound to them. He said, it's sound doctrine biblically, but they got that sound. I said, blessed is the man who knows the joyful sound. Who knows the joyful? Do you still remember the joyful sound? Do you still know what it sounds like coming out of you? Do you still love and praise and glorify and magnify his name? You see, there's times when I feel fenced in and I feel like heaven's turned to brass and I got nowhere to get out of it, no way. And I just start singing him to him and glorifying, magnifying him. And while I'm magnifying him and glorifying him, things begin to change. And I, I, I think praise sometimes is like a missile. And it looks like the heavens are made of brass and, and people will be singing all over the world. And I, I, I don't mean to pick on nobody, but just bear with me. And, and, and they'll be over here in one church and they'll be singing their little hearts out with no music because Lord God knows they don't, you know, that omission theology. And, and, and they'll be singing their hearts out. And the devil will hear it. He'll say, I got to do something about that. Or one of the little imps will hear it. And the devil said, no, 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 let that go by. He said, they believe in water and wafers. He said, they're not dipped in the blood. He said, it'll be okay. Let that go by. And then there'll be a song that comes out of Salt Lake City. And they'll be singing, oh, man, they got a choir that can't be beat, except it's not blood washed. And it's not bought by the blood of Jesus. And all that's just noise ascending, and it's no threat. But then somewhere, there's some little old saint in the back room somewhere, and she's got her hands raised in the air, and she's singing, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And all of a sudden, a missile comes flying up out of there, and it's got blood on the tip of it, and it peels back the brass heavens, and the blessings of God come down, and that old saint keeps right on trucking. It's the same in church. If the blood washed, the redeemed would come together and glorify and magnify God. We wouldn't leave smothered down, feeling like all we've heard is a motivational speech. If we'd open it up, it would tune our ears to a purer sound. You know, I remind you that before the revelation is given, after that fourth chapter, he's taken into that worship service, and then God begins to show him what is to come. Many of you are running around in the dark and in doubt because you don't praise and worship God. You've traded shields of brass for shields of gold. And I don't know about you, but I've got my mind made up that I'm going to praise him and glorify him and magnify him regardless of the cost, regardless of what it takes. I'm going to give God the praise when it looks like the bottom has fallen out. I'm going to glorify him and magnify him. I've, all my years, I've gone from all over this country, and you all that know me know, I have preached praise and worship from one end to the other because I know if I can get you involved, if I can get the blood-bought children of God to glorify and magnify his name in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand of pleasure for everybody. And I want you to have a good life. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have better things. Don't get me wrong. But most of all, I want you to have a better relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to live clean. I want you to live holy. I don't want you to live in bondage. You can't have brass worship. You've got to have pure gold worship. And since you brought it up, may I remind you at the end of the third chapter of the Revelation, we've got the church closing down, honey. He said, I know your works, Laodicea. And since you brought this up, we might as well get on it. He said, I know your works. You see, Laodicea was, was a city and they were very modern for their day. And on, on, on one mountaintop, they had a, 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 a hot spring. And on a mountaintop just over this way, they, they had a, an ice cold spring. And they had the idea to bring hot and cold running water into the city. And so they, they built viaducts and, and troughs that would bring in the water. There was only one problem after all the expense and after all the effort. By the time the water got there, it was neither hot nor cold. And if you've ever drank tepid water, it's not very pleasing to the taste buds or to the slacking of thirst. And he said, I know thy works. He said, but you're lukewarm. And I want you to listen to me good. To know you're lukewarm, you would have first had to been hot because you would have known you cooled off from hot down to lukewarm. If you'd never been anything but cold, you wouldn't realize to you lukewarm would look like a blessing. And so the devil tricked both ends of the spectrum with our people. He brought all you good folks that came out of all the, all the calmer churches, if you will.
and he brought you to our church. And boy, in the beginning, you thought, man, this is red hot. What you didn't know is the old saints were sitting there going, this is not what we came in under. My friend, Daddy Cat, that passed away, in fact, that inspired me so much in the early days. She told me, she said, baby, and Addie would probably be 115 or 20 now if she was still alive. She said, if I could have taken a picture of what we had at the beginning with a spiritual camera and taken a picture of what is today, and this was 35 years ago, she told me. She said, there would be no family resemblance. It doesn't look like the same thing. You see, they would gather early and the men would be over in this pine thicket and the women be over in this pine thicket. And when you got to church, if you didn't get in on the prayer meeting, you walked up in on it and all you could hear was praise God, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and the prince of peace. And you could hear saints praising and glorifying him. They didn't have any instruments but these. When I hear the old African-American spirituals where they just clap in their hands and stomp in the feet, it, 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 it pierces my heart because I know that's what brought them out of bondage, not Abraham Lincoln, but God himself. And I, I listened to our people come out of the bondage of abject poverty. They love to praise his holy name. Glory to God. Do you, do you love to praise him? Do you love, oh God, I feel his presence. Hallelujah to the lamb. Glory and honor and power and might and dominion. King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Hallelujah. And I love to praise his holy name. Thank God for healing my friend Harold Wall this week. Thank God that he's healing James and Von De Carroll. Thank God he healed Miss Diane. Thank God that he's healing my Aunt Bonnie Jean's leg. Thank God he's healing Lori's daddy. Thank God my girl came through this old scare with cancer without a cell in her body. Thank God. Thank God we got food on the table today. We got food for tomorrow. We got the light bill paid. We got shoes on our feet, clothes on our back. Thank God. But most of all, thank God for reaching down in a jail cell with an old burned over junkie and saving me. Thank God for the night you filled me with the Holy Ghost at Southside Assembly of God. Thank God for the first time the glory of the Lord ever rested upon me. Thank God for the first time you ever used me in the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for the first time you ever helped me lead somebody to Jesus. It was at a Christmas cantata in my home church. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, my God, I just feel like getting beside myself. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Blessing and glory and honor and power and might and dominion. King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Bright in the morning star in the lily of the valley. I must remind you of two things before I go. Number one, this is the last act of Rehoboam. He traded a little bit of prosperity for the shields of gold. And just enough, just repented, just enough to keep Shishak off of him, or Shishak off of him, and not being destroyed. But we never hear from Rehoboam again. It is my fear that the modern American church stands on the brink of being replaced or God forbid, even worse, wiped out because they have traded gold for brass. It's not pure, it's not holy. The worship is not effervescent. It's trained and it goes to a syncopated beat 
And the preachers lied and said he felt the presence of God when he wasn't there. At the end of Revelation 3, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And he's already told the church at Laodicea. He said, you say you are rich and increased of goods and in need of nothing. He said, but I say you're blind and naked and miserable. It doesn't matter what you say about your church. It doesn't matter what I say about it. It matters what God says. And they were positive confession church because they said, he said, you say all these things. You claim to be blessed and highly favored, but I say no. And what did he say? Buy of me gold, tried in the fire. Sell everything you got and get back to the purity and the wholehearted worship that brought you this far. He said, I know your works, you're hardworking people. He said, but it's lukewarm by the time it gets to you. And he said, the lukewarmness makes me want to vomit. That's what the word spew means. What if you thought today the worship at your church or your organization made God want to throw up? So he said, there's a remedy. He said, I'm going to open the store one more day. Buy of me gold, try it in the fire. And so my admonition to each of you today is if you've lost your song, if you've lost your fervency, if you've lost your joy, you've lost your strength, or perhaps you never even had them. Buy of him gold, try it in the fire. And then he said, when you get through with that, he said, that'll just be the earnest of your inheritance. He said, when you come to heaven, he said, I got streets made out of gold that lead all the way up to a golden throne. And so praise will be the avenue you will follow to find yourself at the feet of Jesus praising him. Praise. You may think this is unimportant, but it's not only important now, but it'll be important in the ages to come. And we'll keep on praising and glorifying his name. It's time for me to stop. If you have a prayer request, 678 Four seven two nine four nine four, or jubileeministries.org. Be sure to share and subscribe and like this. We're almost at 100 subscribers. We need four more this week, and we'll be there. That's not something I care much about, about numbers, because the number I'm looking for would freak most of you out anyway. But I'm glad to see the blessing of God. You said he adds the increase. He is the increaser. I want to thank you for your giving, for your faithfulness. If you have an offering you'd like to send, you can do it through jubileeministries.org. There's a donate button. Or you can go, you can mail it in to 5009 Lake Miriam Circle, Lakeland, Florida, 33813. Thank you so much for listening to me today. I pray the blessing of the Lord has pierced your heart and wanted you make you move up higher in him. God bless you, Father God. Take the word and pierce our hearts today. Peel the callus off and pour in the oil of gladness. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.